um, because there has been so much circulating, so many fabulous ideas and um, thoughts to provoke. And we certainly have one more very enthusiastic and exciting panel. I'll turn it over to Chris Peterson, who will introduce the panels and panelists. Thanks, Chris. So thank you for staying for the last panel of the conference. I want to especially thank Cecilia and Tanya for all of the work that they put into it. Um, I am very pleased to welcome four researchers who are fellows with the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion. This is a unique research institute on campus, which was founded and run by Professor Bill Maurer in the Anthropology Department. The institute currently supports 86 research projects and over 100 scholars in 36 different countries, many of which are located in Africa. Its mission is to support research on money and technology among the world's poorest people. The research projects examine the everyday uses of money and technology, including the use of alternative currencies, alternative uses of money that are not linked to the more familiar forms of exchange as we know it, as well as the use of technologies that are not available in the U.S., such as using one's mobile <coughs> phone to make money transfers. And that's just scratching the surface of what this institute does. I encourage people to go on the IM TFI website so you can see the array of really interesting scholarship that's going on. Um, so this panel, we've decided that we're not going to do formal presentations. This is going to be a round table. Mm -hmm. And so everyone is going to present um, all of their work. I'm going to do the introductions. But in order to give you an idea of what we mean by money and technology used among the world's poor, we all are going to participate in a skit at the beginning of the panel so that you can get a sense of what's going on. Um, but I, so let me um, introduce our esteemed panelists who have also been here for another conference. The Institute has its annual conference, which just concluded yesterday. And um, so they've all read. So, we are really very fortunate that we were able to overlap and have them here with us today. So um, first is Dr. Edwin Cliff Mensa, who is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Economics, Finance, and Decision Sciences <coughs> excuse me, at the School of Business at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. His research interests include applied economics, consumer economics, agricultural econ, and technological um, adoption. His research at the Institute focuses on the economics of the use of mobile platforms for monetary transactions for e-money, as well as economic impact of currency modification and money management among Ghana's ultra poor. He received his PhD in economics from North Carolina State U University. And his research partner is Professor Richard uh, Kane, he received his PhD in business admin in the field of business statistics from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He joined the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, where they are both colleagues, in August 2008 as a tenure track assistant professor. His research interests are in the fields of applied and computational statistics, financial economics, financial eco econometrics, because this is big stuff, I don't even know what that means, um, time series modeling and forecasting in real estate finance and economics. Okay. Um, and then on, on the end <coughs> of we have um, Professor Jane Mutunga, who is, has a PhD in environment and community development from Kenyatta University in Nairobi and Kenya, and in the department where she's also currently now the chairperson Dr. Mutinda's portfolio includes research emphasis on gender and environment, community resource management, poverty alleviation, and microfinance among women's groups in Kenya. And her research partner is Dr. Mudugikiti, who is a professor at Hopton College in Hopton, New York, and adjunct faculty at Emory. University's Rollins School of Health, Public Health in the Department of Global Health in Atlanta. Dr. Kichi's work involves research training and publishing in the areas of communication, sustainable development, and international health policy. She has a PhD in communication from Cornell University, which included a one-year study in the International Health at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in Baltimore. 
Um, I could have truncated their bios. If you're more, if you're interested in learning more about these folks, please uh, refer to the biographies in your packet. But in the, so to be to start things off, we're doing a skit. Okay. <laughs> ah. Man. Did my wife. Should we come in front? Sit up. Yeah. This is tough. Yeah. Now, listen, I don't have any money. I know you've been complaining that this Christmas, you know, you need some money for something. But I just don't have money. And this boy to be nice. Listen, boy, drink some water. There's no money today, okay? <laughs> well, listen, the banks, I'm sure by the time I get to you, that's what we are closed. Um, and even if I go, frankly speaking, I don't like going to the bank. So the atmosphere is too intimidating. And filling the papers is too much work. Yeah. And the queue, it will take me forever <laughs> and ever and ever. I don't want to go there. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? Yeah. Hey, wait, I'm talking to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> My wife. <laughs> I learned of something. Yeah. I hear there is something called mobile money. Have you heard about it? Yes, I've heard about it. You have? Yeah. So why didn't you tell me? Yeah. <laughs> the women of today. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. I hear that thing, you put the money on your phone, and then somehow you go and get it. Yeah. Anyway, I've learned of it also. Yeah. So I want to call my sister. Yeah. Jane, you remember Jane? Yes, I do. you remember Auntie Jane? <laughs> you better somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling Auntie Jane. And maybe I can ask Auntie Jane to send me some money through mobile money. Then we can have some Christmas chicken. <laughs> nice. Good idea. He wants ball. Always complaining, you want a ball. Wait, okay, my wife, you'll be okay. Hello. Hey. Jane, Jane, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jane. Is this my brother? Jane, yeah, you're very Cliff. Oh, oh my Jane. goodness, how are you? I'm doing well, Jane. By the way, let's cut through the chase. Jane, this is very bad. This is crucial. Um, uh, I need some money. What? Yeah. You're always <laughs> borrowing money from me. <laughs> oh, that's just been only three times. No, no, no. I think you Africans then need to get an agenda. How come you're always borrowing money? Well, listen, oh. listen. I don't have money. In fact, that's why you were sent to school. I did it. So you are the ones who's supposed to make money and send me every now and then. Listen, I hear there's something called mobile money. Which, since you live in the city, you must go away. Go do mobile money and send me the money right now. I have to get some money to, to, to you know, celebrate this Christmas. Quick, right? Okay, let me see if I have anything left in my account. I can only send it if I have anything in my account. Okay, great. Please check for me. And I'll wait, you know, call me right away. Okay, let's hold on. Hmm, let me see. I could use Safaricom, I could use Airtel. Hmm. Yeah, let me try Safaricom if I have any balances here. Send to my brother. But he's always wanting money. Okay, what do you think I should use? Which program? I think you should use that one. That one? Mm -hmm. Okay. M Pesa. M Pesa. I think that yeah. I think I have some balance there. Okay. Oops. Let's see what M Pesa is going to say. Whether I have any money left. Well, I could send money. That's what he wants me to do. I can withdraw. I guess I probably should withdraw if he needs the money. I can buy airtime. I'll need that to call him back. I can pay my bill with it. And then I can check my account. Let me check my account and see what is in there. Okay, great. Okay, I've got enough. I can send them a thousand Kenya shillings. Send money. Oh, I need to enter your number. The number. Okay, let me enter his number. Okay. Okay, send. Let's come. Oh, my, Wait, yeah. have yeah. my wife, I'll be right back. Let me go and talk to you. Lori, you said I don't want you to worry. Your, your mm -hmm. Let, let me go and talk to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me go and talk to the agent, and then, uh, you know, I will. 
get the money so we can and sell it. And don't get lost in the city. I mean, I'm sure what is, you know, I'll be right back. So I'm going to talk to the, the agent, the authorities there, so I can get my money back. Oh, good. Well, I'm an agent. Ah, wonderful. I, see, I, I didn't want to go to the bank, and I know there's something wrong with our money. So, you know, my sister sent me the money. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, it's good that I'm here. I look right next door, so I'm here all the time. And this is fine. I have an ID here, and I have the code also. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so. Check the code. Yeah. Okay. That checks out. And do you have an ID? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You didn't see the first time I showed you. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, yeah. um, I'm going to go. My wife is waiting. Yeah, <laughs> just like the... Uh, the one is a one dollar. Thank you. <laughs> 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 we have the money. We have the money. We have now. You can get this ball. Yeah. You better be a good boy. Can I? Can I? Okay. This is our But we must send money to our daughter. Okay. We must send money to uh, our daughter in school. Yeah. Uh, before we start spending on chicken. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> let me. Do the mobile oh. money to her. Yeah. So she doesn't have to go to the bank. Okay. Go through that process, in pencil, that, that stuff. Send. Oh, Daddy! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's perfect timing because I'm in school and I need some money. I better go get some from the M Pesa agent. <laughs> hello, Mr. M Pesa agent. Oh, hello. I am, I am the regulator. Oh, And I'm going to tell you we have some new rules. Gosh, let me get out the old yeah. <laughs> Okay. The new rules are much longer than the old rules. But you know, okay. I could help you out maybe if you give me a little something to make it easier for you. Look, literally, it's such an issue here. I don't know if I have enough money, but what maybe you come have? back tomorrow and I can see what I can do. Is that okay? In the meeting, yes. Okay. Make sure you read that. All right, because regulations are always changing. It's very hard to know. Mr. Mpisa agent. Hello. Daddy sent me some money for school. Okay. And how much? Let's see. Okay, looks like you got 50 cents. That's <laughs> <laughs> the ready clues. Okay, great. Um, and there it is. Thanks. Thanks, Mpesa agent. <laughs> okay, that ends our skit. <laughs> Um, I just want to highlight really quickly, actually, a little bit of background about the mobile money services. And I'm going to read. Uh, this morning, we, uh, at the conference, we were able to receive one of the papers written by our colleague, part of the research we're doing with IMTFI. They've been very good in encouraging us to publish some of our research in mobile money technology. And I want to read a paragraph, because I think it puts in context what we're going to talk about really quickly. Uh, mobile financial services are among the most promising mobile applications in the developing world. Mobile money could become a general platform that transforms entire economies as it is, other sec as it is adopted across commerce, healthcare, agriculture, and other sectors. To date, at least 110 money mobile systems have been deployed with more than 40 million users. The most well-known system is M-Pesa, the one we just used in the skit. Started in Kenya and is now operational in six countries. It has 20 million users who transferred 500 million a month during 2011. While the benefits of mobile money payment systems are clear, observers remain divided over whether mobile money systems are truly fulfilling their growth potential. These were some of the questions we were asking about mobile money technology. What are some of the advantages? What are some of the disadvantages? Uh, do all our societies need this? How can they transform our economies? How can they transform our context? So the first presentation we're going to uh, give is uh, with my colleague, uh, Jane. And that's looking at some of the work we've been doing in Kenya. Uh, we, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, some of the work we've been doing in Kenya uh, we did, we've done two studies, all supported by IMCFI in 2011. We did a study looking at women's groups. 
and how women's groups uh, play a role in our economic ground and how money technology can help that, mobile money technology can help facilitate that uh, involvement and engagement within our society. So we looked at some of the women's groups we've been working with and that's what she's going to talk about. Out of that research, uh, one of our 21 women's groups that we collected data on was 14 women who were visually impaired. They were blind, all of them. And they challenged us that the challenges they have with mobile money technology are very different from what sighted people experience. So they challenged us to write another proposal and we're grateful to IMTFI. They supported it and that's the process we're in now is collecting data on looking at what is the use and what are some of the challenges and issues around mobile money technology for the visually impaired. Populations that are often marginalized, left out of our economic development, uh, often ignored, stigmatized in our society. And how can we bring in, include in the process of financial inclusion, uh, these populations that we often ignore within our society. So that's what we're gonna talk about briefly. So she'll talk about the first part, the study briefly, and I'll talk about the second. Okay, thank you very much, um, When uh, we applied for the funds from IMTFI, we wanted to look at 21 women groups which we had trained in management, in investments, and uh, it's out of these 21 women groups which are based in Eastern Kenya that uh, we collected most of the data. We were curious because you see this concept of mobile money service in Kenya has really grown over the years. And we knew that in the past, the women used to have difficulties in sending money during their monthly meetings. Normally in Kenya, what happens is that uh, women work in groups and uh, they form groups of about 10 to 15 and they contribute some money and every other month they give that money to an individual. We call them merry-go-rounds. But now, uh, because we have trained them so that uh, they were able now to start investing and to start uh, buying shares, we wanted to see how the mobile money service had really uh, contributed to their development. And we went out to the field, we interviewed them, and uh, we found that actually the mobile money service was really having an impact on them. And uh, uh, just briefly to say, about the findings from the research that we, we, we came up with, we wanted to know what mobile money technology the groups were using. This is because in Kenya, apart from the Safaricom, we have other mobile providers. We have Airtel, we have Tangaza, and we have uh, uh, Telcom money. And so we wanted to know, out of these uh, 21 groups, which mobile money service were these women using? And we found that uh, the majority of them were using Safaricom and, uh, to transact their business. So instead of having to meet every other month uh, together uh, to collect the money and give it to whoever or use it for whatever purpose they were using, they were able now to use M-Pesa the way uh, we have, uh, we have uh, demonstrated here. So instead of having to travel many miles to attend the meeting, I could comfortably from my house send the money to the treasurer of the group and then um, uh, I would not be penalized. So those are some of the findings uh, that uh, we found. Then uh, we also wanted to look at the opportunities and benefits of this mobile money. And of course there were, bono uh, there were opportunities and there were benefits because the service <coughs> was very convenient the only other problem we found that at least um, most of the women groups uh, reported that they were, they had been, uh, I mean, they, they had been able to lose money at one time. Because sometimes this, as it has been shown, this uh, kind of, uh, when you send money, sometimes you could have the, uh, you could, ha you could uh, fall into the trap of sending the money to the wrong number. And sometimes when you send to the wrong number, some people are not honest enough to return the money to you. So those are some of the challenges we found the, the, the women were facing. Other issues that we found uh, they had was where you find um, 
the fraud, uh, the people who are not, uh, who are fraud, uh, they, they, they would use fraudulent kind of uh, method, methods to send uh, money, and I don't know what technology they were using, but they use their phone and they pretend that they are from Safaricom, and then they send the money and a message comes to say you have received money. And then they would call you immediately and tell you, I've sent money in your phone, can you return it? So if originally you had money in your phone, you would send your own money thinking that they have sent you money. So those are some of the challenges that we found in that, uh, in that, in that study. Uh, uh, so uh, there were lessons uh, to be learned in form of the research in that actually if you develop the, the mobile money technology further, it can ease the operations of the group. And that is now what led us, uh, as she has said, as we continue, I, I mean, as we were interviewing these groups, there was this one particular group that was made up of uh, 14 blind women. And they challenged us. And much as the other sighted women were having challenges in the group, they told us that uh, we needed to go back and carry out research and see how we can assist them in terms of uh, running their, their group. Normally, we call them Chama group. Uh, these are uh, groups which we run in most of uh, Africa. And uh, so that is the second part of the research that Lunga is going to talk about. Just briefly, because I see time is going uh, quick, uh, quickly. Our studies, both of them were qualitative in nature, um, very much interacting with uh, the people in the field to understand their uh, context. Uh, we also included in our design a workshop. We have found this to be one of the most effective ways of doing uh, research. And well, I know a lot of you are students. This was a, another way also we found we could engage students, graduate students, both from Kenyatta University and both from Houghton in New York. And they helped us whether with the logistics or the research, data collection, analysis, and others uh, as well. In the workshop, we brought all the stakeholders that have to do with mobile money services and the groups we were doing. And then documentation and obviously dissemination are key components of our, our study. But just to quickly highlight some of the issues that came out of uh, our work with the visually impaired, that's coming out. We actually haven't analyzed any of the data. That is coming out in terms of um, technology. Issue in terms of, and I'll categorize them based on opportunities, obstacles. Affordability was one of them. In most of our societies, in our communities in Kenya, Literally, disability is associated with poverty. And they kept emphasizing that. In fact, one woman said, uh, disability and poverty are brothers. And that communicated the message. And so oftentimes, uh, that's an issue. But yet, the cost and expense of accessing um, the products and services of these mobile money technologies is a huge challenge uh, for individuals who are visually impaired or have a disability. The issue of independence and privacy. Oftentimes, people with visual impairment wanted and strive for their independence and privacy. But it's such a lack of autonomy. They cannot see. They have to tell somebody else their PIN number. Just like when uh, Cliff went to pick his money. He had, he, you know, if he was visually impaired, you'd have to give it his PIN number. If you give somebody your PIN number, you're basically opening up your account yes. to them. And that was the problem. We found a lot of people were losing money that way, visually impaired were losing money. Somebody, somebody who's not honest or an agent who's not honest, they would transfer money into their account and they would never know. And so we had story after story of people with visual impairment who lost money. Security was an issue versus distrust. Uh, the whole point of mobile money services is to try to improve people's livelihoods, yet they're stuck often in the poverty cycle. We heard that a lot. Um, the fact that Safaricom pretty much is a monopoly is a, is a big challenge. I mean, there's other services, but it's, it is a monopoly. And then policy and reality. We have to match policy, whether it's by our service providers, whether it's our government. So we brought the government into our workshop because we wanted them to, you know, we wanted them to hear what some of the issues are. So these were some of the issues that are coming out, emerging out of our research. We want to push and make sure that we tie in policy in more effective. So I'm going to turn back to okay. All right. So 
as you can see, if you, if you actually can do transactions that way, just you know, pay your bills by phone, etc. that would be awesome, isn't it? <clears throat> you don't need the internet. I'm not talking mobile banking. I'm talking mobile money. They're sending the money straight from one person to another person, from a person to a person. That would be fantastic. So we see financial inclusion through using mobile money as a means of empowerment. Right? So when we heard the Kenyan story, uh, the successes that have been told, etc., and the fact that Ghana also has <coughs> uh, seen the introduction of mobile money, into a system, and with this high volume of uh, phone penetration, we felt that there was a need for us to see to what extent mobile money had been you know, adapted in Ghana, and what perception at all Ghanaians had of uh, mobile money. So that was the area that we looked at. We, look, we looked at adoption of mobile money, uh, and also we also looked at the consumer perception of mobile money in rural and urban uh, Ghana amongst the poor in these places. So <clears throat> we actually went out and scouted. We, we our study dwelt on both the qualitative aspect and the quantitative aspect. Quantitatively, we just designed a survey, a validated survey, and we administered that for that analysis of consumer perception. Qualitatively, we were actually looking for lived experiences and then to see what people actually uh, were doing as far as mobile money was concerned. So we went through the streets of our crowd, we went through the slums, the ghettos, uh, we talked to uh, market porters, we call them Kayali, street beggars. We talked to diverse group of people. In fact, we decided to incorporate merchants as well. We had some merchants and some market women so we can get the poor, non-poor perspective of uh, this whole uh, story of mobile money adoption. And uh, <clears throat> we realized that in, in Ghana, our first study showed that the level of awareness was relatively low. Uh, but interestingly, our second study shows that the level of awareness seems to be high now, both in the rural areas and in the uh, urban areas. People are getting to know mobile money more. But people did cite some barriers to the adoption of mobile money. First of all, a bunch of people, especially the poor people, the very poor people said they have no knowledge about mobile money. They have very little knowledge about mobile money. And in fact, when we were going around, they actually thought that we were representatives of these mobile money operators. Although we did introduce ourselves to them as you know, researchers from the United States coming down to conduct research into the adoption of mobile money, uh, at the end of the day, they still would comment this way, say something like this. Uh, now that you guys have explained it to us, we think we will do it for your company. So they still affiliated us mm -hmm. to the mobile <laughs> phone company. <clears throat> the phone companies have spent, I would say, millions of Ghana cities on adverts, aggressively, I believe my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Humble Ho, will, will attest to that. Billions of dollars, you go and you see billboards flashing of mobile money you hear on the news, mobile money, mobile money, speaks of it everywhere. But people are still not aware and have very little money. So I believe uh, that person to person, you know, uh, marketing will be much more effective than just sitting in the office and throwing adverts as bombs to people. Uh, people that cite fraud, risk, security as a problem, all right? The network security, the connectivity is an issue for people, so they're wondering what if the network doesn't work the way I expect? And what if the person at the other end does something fraudulent to embezzle my funds? What about that? So people are quite apprehensive about this product. And to some extent, especially amongst the very poor people, the auto poor, they would complain that uh, the process is just tedious, arduous, complex. You know, they are quite apprehensive about the technology. And just to go through steps to send money and all the stuff was just uh, something that they were not willing to do. So like I said, there, were, there are some security issues to be dealt with in Ghana. Trust is certainly an issue uh, in Ghana. There have been instances where uh, financial institutions have been in Ghana, conducted business and voted away with funds, especially in some rural areas. And so people are skeptical when private institutions, you know, uh, begin to do transactions uh, this way. And now, this is a country that has been cash-based primarily. 
So think about it. Now taking the poor person who knows cash and prefers the tangibility of money and telling that person that you can now do a cashless transaction. All right? And in, the, in, the, in an environment where they've learned and heard of instances where people have embezzled funds or bolted with funds that people have collected, that certainly was an issue. So trust was certainly something <coughs> to be dealt with. And the few that knew about it also did complain, especially market women, did complain about the accessibility of transactional agents. You would want to do it, but how do I get my money? A market woman, I'm just quoting on the daughter line. She said, well, if I do mobile money, how do I get my money? I cannot leave my words, I'm quoting her. I cannot leave my words and go roaming around a car to look for an agent to collect my money. And in fact, she is right. Because it was very hard for us to actually find the transactional agents. The authorized agents who would serve as sources where the individual would go to source the funds were not visible. <clears throat> they were not in the place where the people were. And market women you know, said that if these agents were in the midst of the market, if they had outlets in the market, they probably would consider doing that. So that's something that the, the mobile companies need to think about. There is also this issue of inter interoperability of the platforms. The platforms are, are touted as though you could send money through MTN money and probably you could take it over Ether. But the, the platforms are not interoperable. So although it's touted out there, people still cannot do that. So if I got the money on MTN, it better be MTN I go to. I cannot go to my Ether uh, to make the, trans the transaction. And then unfortunately, there is this issue of uh, competition with the already existing means of channeling funds for maintenances. Uh, if I'm used to sending money to my parents through the bus drive or a friend, a family member, etc., and I'm just comfortable with that, all right? And unfortunately, that same thing, somehow, quite competes with these mobile companies. They are comfortable with that. Um, so these were some of the barriers that we uh, uncovered in the, in the process of uh, talking to these individuals in our politics. And in the interest of time, I'll just wrap it here and allow the questions to flow. Yes, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Mensah's uh, talk. So, as a statistician, uh, when I started to join this uh, project, I, you know, to for, kind of was, uh, you know, look at this all this uh, picture from the statistical analysis. But when actually I, uh, we go further and further, I find actually. This mobile money is, and you know, not just about a number, which from the conventional statistical sense, actually a number actually here uh, means much more than that. So uh, I feel ex ex very excited. It's actually uh, more, a lot of work actually need, needs to be done. Uh, so, so supported by IMTFI, actually, uh, like uh, Dr. Mensah uh, mentioned earlier, we need to know actually uh, a lot of things. Um, number one. Uh, from the research perspective, we would like to know, uh, you know, pro from the customers uh, or marketing kind of perspective, we would like to understand, or at least uh, maybe, un you know, reveal, uh, reveal some, some, some mechanism uh, in this kind of a very new business model. Okay, secondly, uh, because uh, as a new business, um, different stakeholders actually need to be, uh, need to get involved. Like, uh, if a consumer, let's say, have a really a very good awareness about this, okay, but uh, why the market is slow, okay? So this means we need to get a, you know, businessmen, practitioners, policymakers, and uh, you know a lot of different different groups to get uh, involved. So so this is why next year in March, uh, actually we, we just came back from uh, Sudana in October, and I feel you know I learned a lot because uh, this is very new to me actually. Uh, uh, in March, we're going to have actually a two-day conference. So I, I tried to, of course, I'm, I'm st still in the, I mean, the, the kind of the initial kind of stage of trying to explore the, the secret of this, uh, or the mechanism, uh, mechanism of this uh, new business model. In that two-day conference, we're going to have a lot of different uh, stakeholders coming to this conference. Researchers, uh, practitioners, and uh, policy makers, and also actually some of the researchers are, are from the international uh, uh, areas such, such as uh, the researchers from uh, Kenya, uh, which is an, a region which basically see a uh, a uh, very uh, big uh, success in this field. So we are we are doing the ongoing work. So. so 
we have about 45 minutes um, to open it up for some discussion. And um, um, I thought that the pre I mean, we have two very different kinds of situations and experiences with mobile money in one in Kenya, as we first started, one in Ghana. And I, th I thought the contrast was really very interesting to talk. But I, what I'd love to do is just sort of open it up to the floor and just begin uh, a conversation. Yeah, um, uh, thank you very much for the work you're doing. I'm fascinated by it. Um, I haven't even heard of, I'm not sure about mobile money. I know that people do a lot of things with mobile phone, uh, but I didn't know that uh, it was uh, you know, in this sense where they use it. Uh, the only comment I want to make is uh, about method, you know, just, um, and, and this is, completely without prejudice. It's, 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 uh, it's just uh, an epistemological question. Uh, when when you, 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 you did say uh, Ndunge that your method is qualitative, okay? I'm not saying anything wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you see, uh, when somebody a social scientist say my work is qualitative or quantitative exclusively. I, I think uh, we have to rethink the way we talk about those binaries. Um, any work that is just completely quantitative is just a formula. <laughs> Either, you know, even, yes, it doesn't go, and any work that is completely qualitative is almost denying that it is empirical. Mm -hmm. And so, so some scientists should divest themselves mm -hmm. of that binary. Mm -hmm. So if you say, I'm doing qualitative, which means you just ignore data that will make your work more systematic. Mm -hmm. I think it just, it, it, people should think about the degree mm -hmm. in which they will employ quantitative data, mm -hmm. rather than just walking away from it. Yeah. For example, um, when James said that most of the people who use uh, their phone for mobile, for mobile, uh, uh, the mobile money uh, transactions, that they use Safari. How do you know if you didn't, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And is it just a hunch or an anecdote? Mm -hmm. So, Again, you know, I expect that your work, you know, you would have systematized it. Yeah. You know, I know how many, and you know, at least the, at the level of simple correlation. Yeah. So yeah. I think that that's just what I want to say. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, it could cost me, you know, maybe sometimes I present my work and they start trying to use a lot of quantitative data. And then later on, somebody say, oh, I'm quantitative, so I mean, I'm qualitative sociologist. I'm, I'm this, I, he just doesn't, yeah. yes. No, excellent point. And you know, can you guys say your names and the program you're with? Yeah. Sorry? I'm just curious. Can you say your name? Can you say your name? Oh, yeah. so we know. My name is Hugo Mokeji. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a historian at the yeah. University of California, Berkeley, in the Department of African Studies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, African American Studies. Mm -hmm. I, I studied history from the 15th century onward. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't make any distinction yeah. between yeah. politics or yeah. what they yeah. were. I engage yeah. all of them. Yeah. So I, that's why I don't no, understand. No, that's yes. good. That's good, yeah. No, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. And recognize we're presenting very quickly that we're just highlighting. And that when we say it doesn't mean you're proving the other. No. I mean, a lot of our literature review is on quantitative data, like you're saying. So we're not excluding it. I was just commenting much of it was the format is interview, in-depth interviews, and what have you. So we're not saying we've excluded quantitative. No, we have a lot of statistics, but a lot of it is from secondary literature review. So um, we were just highlighting. So I agree with you. It's not one or the other. And I know the academy likes to have those wars, methodological <laughs> wars. But I think they, they, they feed off of each other. And they complement one another quite effectively. So, and we do have statistical data. <laughs> Oh, I, I was itching, but I do have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, my, one, one thing is, like, 
like when you're studying the impact of this on blind women, um, you know, it's just, I mean, it doesn't, it's, it's not just in case. I mean, they have, yeah. they're going to have trouble yeah. with the same issues. It's not, yeah. And, and the same with why, you know, sometimes one of the negatives is you send the money to the wrong, yeah. I mean, plenty of people are wired you know, to the wrong. So I don't understand why it would focusing on that because I think that's what what is it about in cases that you want to study is, is one question. And I guess my having used in Pesa in Kenya, what is the downside? Yeah. I mean I just don't I mean my question is why aren't we doing it over here? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to looking at what's going wrong over there. It's yeah. it's going on like yeah. crazy. Yeah. And I, I think we're crazy not to do something. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think we could learn a lot from the Kenyans. Yeah. Could I just add to that very quickly? Mm -hmm. um, I um, gave a talk in the Netherlands um, in September, and they were supposed to reimburse me for expenses, and they're very embarrassed because it still hasn't come through. And I kept thinking, as I saw your skit, mm, drag. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have this. You know, I wish that you know, in case it would make it so much faster. But anyway, mm -hmm. just a quick. <laughs> Uh, maybe I can respond uh, to the issue of the blind women and why we decided uh, to do a research on uh, blind person. Uh, among the groups we were working with in Eastern Kenya, one group was composed of 14 blind women, and actually they were using M-Pesa. When we, the first round of the women groups, we found that uh, they were using M-Pesa to transact business because they also have needs but they were using other people to assist them, you know, to send money, to receive money, to withdraw. So when uh, we did the second proposal, we chose to study them, but not just the one group. We included now the blind population in, in Kenya, uh, basically made up of uh, most of the students in a school called Tika School for the Blind, Machakos, School for the Blind, Kenyatta University, we have a big population of blind students. So we decided to study these groups and how they were coping with the M-Pesa. Because the way the M-Pesa came up in Kenya, it was so fast. Uh, statistics from Safaricom, they told us, actually, when they launched the project, they, they just wanted to deal, they were expecting about a thousand people to take up the system. But it went beyond, up to now it's still going uh, in so many other applications. So when we, when we realized there was this need, we did the proposal and we went around, um, we found actually the women had needs and we also found that uh, there were other applications that have been developed for the blind people so that they can, uh, they can use to send money and to receive money. Although some of the models are not very complete, some of the respondents have bought these, uh, these, uh, these phones. Audio. Audio. So they use the voice. Mm -hmm. The phone talks to them so that every step, they can even know who is calling. If you call them, they'll know. And all those uh, steps up to the getting the money from the agent, they can do it themselves. So that's why we created that interest and uh, we've, we've learned a lot and uh, we've partnered even with, uh, with, uh, with some professors from the University of Nairobi who are also helping to perfect this gadget to make sure that the, the blind people have something better. They can be part of the process of this MPSA in Kenya. <laughs> But you also asked, just to add on to that real quickly so we can get other question. you asked why M-Pesa? So it's almost like why the focus on M-Pesa? I think that was the point we were trying to make when we said there's a contradiction because on one side we're saying the opportunities of diversification of these services and these platforms. But on the other side is what literature is showing us, secondary literature is showing us, it's called network power where one network basically controls is a monopoly and that's the reality in Kenya. I mean, <coughs> Everybody we spoke to amongst the visually impaired and amongst all the women's group yeah. use Safaricom, use Empesa. In fact, we can ask, why don't you use these other ones? That was our follow-up question. And they'll say, a couple of the women said, well, we have Airtel, but it's too expensive. So it's just sitting on my phone. I registered for it, but I don't use it because it's too expensive. 
So if we heard more tied to cost. So when you ask the Mpesa, the reality of it is there's a monopoly. I mean, Safaricom pretty much dominates the market in Kenya, and that's that was part of our focus. Okay. Which I think is a downside of you know some of the research. It can be a downside of the research because we focus so much on Safaricom, we ignore others, and we've been, we've invited other players to come to our workshops, but they don't want to come when Safaricom is there. So mm -hmm. all our workshops have only had Safaricom because that's who all are. Just one question. I mean, you, you, you can't take a step in Kenya without tripping over an Mpesa. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sure. they're just exactly. there. So, yeah. I mean, in a sense, that's a positive yeah. for having a monopoly yeah. because they're just yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, you, so Airtel, you can't get, you can't use it, you can't go to Mpesa and use Airtel. It's, you gotta, you gotta use that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was what Cliff was highlighting. Is yeah. part of the problem with these. They're not, you can't, yeah. they're not interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem. So when one is, has on a monopoly, you pretty much, they pretty much control the market. They, they but see, what I love about Impesa is it shows the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. side of what happened in Kenya. I mean, they didn't have internet. They didn't have this. They didn't exactly. have that. So they yeah. started manipulating their phones, they came up with that and exploded. And, and I mean, it just, I mean, it goes back to capitalism 101. Eventually somebody's <laughs> going to, I would think somebody's going to come up yeah. with something more competitive than in peso and, you know, cut them off. Yeah, there's, uh, there's one, one group uh, called Tangaza. It's the one which now has come, which ones, uh, you can now send money, you can interact through cross, you know, through either you receive money from Airtel. In other words, it wants to be open to all these, uh, whatever, Tangaza, it's a new one. And right now it has about uh, one million or two, going to two million subscribers. It's a new one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation of that. I think it's a highlight of how the development of technologies is uh, helping also in the economic development of, of, of within the African continent, you know, and the transaction of business and so on. However, my concern was um, with regard to the the context of research. You for the for you is in Ghana, right? Mm -hmm. And this is in, in Kenya. And uh, I was trying to look at it in terms of the samples. You know how how the selection of the samples apparently uh, in Kenya it seems to be more among women, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And we did only Eastern Kenya women. We have worked with for the last five years, so we did yes. all the groups that we worked with. Yeah. Okay, and for the Ghana, in Ghana, Ghana, it seems to be a cross board. You know, a cross board because our goal was to find out uh, what was out there, exploratory. It was yes. a cross board we had. Uh, focus groups as well to the team. Now that structured uh, study with a survey uh, went beyond that. The first study we had 275 people who was participating in that, and then the second study we have about uh, 800. Uh, we have 800 consumers at the moment participating in that study. So we, we're trying to get a better sense. Yes. And that data is yet to know. Yeah, that's good. My confusion is whether it is actually the same study. No, no, no. No, we have two no. different. We don't. It is actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 completely two different. Are completely two, yeah, two yeah. yeah, two studies. So your reports will be different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. The scale was off the cuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's yeah, that's not the same. Yeah, they, 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 no. they, yeah, they don't brought it together. There is one thing. I think no, it's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, actually, I'm I'm kind of happy to hear about this. I don't know anything about it. So this is my first day hearing about Impasso. I don't even know what it is, but I wish that I had it. <laughs> when I was in Saudi Arabia a couple months ago and uh, in Egypt, when I couldn't get money for four or five days, mm. and, and finally someone said, if you want money, you have to go to a Sharia bank. <laughs> and I said, well, what's a Sharia bank? Mm. And I noticed that, I mean, I got in the cab and I said, I need you to take me to the Sharia bank. And they take me to this place, and it's all these Saudis and Muslims from everywhere, and non-Muslims getting money sent straight by phone call to a bank, and you picked it up. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's the same thing, but they need to get it over there. I'm, I'm into business, so I'll be thinking about it. <laughs> but um, I would like to talk to you about that. And, and I'm just like, 
I can't believe they have this in Kenya. What about Sudan? Do they have it in Sudan? I didn't have them plenty over in Sudan as well. Trying to transfer. I couldn't even get dollars, yeah. American US dollars in Sudan when I was there for a whole while. Mm -hmm. And of course that was, oh, they don't take credit cards because yeah. they're on embargo. Mm -hmm. So that was hell. My money didn't mean anything in the Sudan. Okay? <laughs> and for the Americans to, to bring up to that reality that we don't want your dollars. And then when you did have a dollar, it was worth 2.2. So, I mean, Sudan had really grown in terms of uh, money at that time. So, I'll be talking to you in the end to let me know about this project. I'm always working with investors in healthcare, so I'm sure they'd be interested in this project. So, thanks for sharing all of this. I'm and feel free to go to the IMTA5 website, has got excellent publications, resources. It's got all our working papers, so mm -hmm. you can actually read not just about these studies, yeah. mm -hmm. but about many more from all over the world. Well, what about the security issues? Are there security issues on it, though? Because, you know, um, I get all kinds of things in my email, send me money from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you say that. So I'm like, you know what, I'm not saying I'm like, is that going to be a problem? That's all I'm saying. Yeah. 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 There are security issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you, you're saying uh, security between uh, Well, you I mean, and if you pick up a phone, I mean, I don't know if they have contracts. I bought a contract on my phones in different places, but right. sometimes you have these credits. So I'm like, you know, if you're on the phone and you try to transfer money, you run out of credit. That's an issue, I'm sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I mean yeah. that's a little bit of understanding about technology. So there, there has to be some security issues about uh, not just calling back mm -hmm. and somebody saying, well, what's your, you didn't, did you send this money? Right. Um, yeah. Have there been any severe uh, security issues of people tapping into it, taking the money and all that kind of stuff? Or pretty, pretty, pretty safe a lot. Those are real concerns. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. so, those are real concerns. Uh, uh, in Ghana, we have what we call Sakawa, and we have people sitting in cafes especially Nigerians. No, 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 and some Ghanaians. <laughs> some Ghanaians, right? So, so there are people out there uh, doing that. And, 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 and in this uh, environment as well, I'm sure as it continues to perpetuate in the system, uh, people will try to, uh, you know, get their share of the market through Sakawa fraud and other activities, but the, the phone companies, uh, I will not vouch, I will not you know, speak for them per se, but I'm sure that they're also trying to find ways to offset such security problems, uh, at least to minimize it. You might not be able to eliminate it completely, but to minimize it to the very minimum tolerable level, I think that would be a reasonable thing to do. Maybe just to add on uh, that, every in Kenya, if you are sending money or receiving money through M-Pesa, you have your secret PIN number, okay. PIN, known to you alone. Okay. So when you receive the money, you go to the agent and you just, uh, you, you just crawl and uh, say withdraw money and you enter your PIN, which you know. You are not supposed to show to the agent. Uh, you just, uh, you just, and then, when you press uh, withdraw, the, the message will go to the agent without reveal, uh, revealing your, your pin. So there's, there's a, actually people now feel secure with money in their mobile phone. Yeah, yeah. 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 they feel safer. Yeah, they're carrying in your bag. Yeah. The other thing is the companies, I know Safaricom, for example, has recognized fraud is one of their biggest issues. So in their marketing strategies, in their website, if you go to their website, they have a whole section on how to avoid fraud. <coughs> and so they actually explain to people, now, we told them, for the people in the rural areas, how do you expect them, number one? I mean, they don't have electricity, they don't have computers, they don't have access to that information. So they've done small documents where they get them translated and they train the agents to talk about fraud, how to avoid it and what have you. So there is, they do recognize fraud as one of the biggest problems and challenges security is one of the biggest. Thank you. Oh, well, actually, um, there's two things. Just wanted to comment on the, the study of the, the rotating credit uh, societies. Is that credit is an issue, and uh, two days ago we heard this fascinating talk about how now uh, people are uh, uh, lending uh, micro credit with uh, global money in Kenya so that you can you can 
get a loan from your microcredit organization and you can send money and pay it back and so forth. And so that's an exciting thing. But the other thing I just wanted to talk about is the, uh, ask about the, the cell phones themselves. I know that one of the wonderful things in Kenya is that people have developed software that don't require a soft smartphone that you can do smart things with ordinary phones and that means ordinary people can afford them. But also, I can imagine over time that people are going to want to upgrade to smarter phones. And I wonder if that's starting and whether they're thinking about you know, new ways to engage in social transactions or money transactions where a slightly smarter phone would make a difference. Is that happening? In Ghana, uh, smartphones are quite present. And I call it people are thanks to the Chinese. <laughs> but in Kenya also, are you gonna to add to your point, in Kenya what we're also seeing is a trend of people carrying two or three phones mm -hmm. for different reasons. So you see like just how I had it, you see somebody like this. Mm -hmm. One of them is for M Pesa, the other one is now for talking and communicating talking, with another. Yes. You know, there are smartphones for communication. Yeah. yeah. So we're seeing that trend. Why? Very much. Why? Huh? Why? Why aren't you doing it all on one phone? You can't fit the same card. Same card. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They have those dual SIM card right. phones now. Yeah. Where you can switch back and forth. Yeah. 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 You can't do it at the same time. Yeah. You can do them both on the yeah. same phone. It's not at the same time. If it, has, right. if it takes just one, one SIM, SIM card, card. Yes. Yes. then you cannot. Takes two. That yeah. phone, hers, takes two. She's got Airtel and she's got Safaricom. So that's when I was choosing the menu. Mm -hmm. That's what I was choosing. But most people have just a basic phone. Oh, yeah. But they can do a visa and talk, but just not at the same time. No. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Right. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of wanted to follow up. Are there any liabilities for the company? Because if there are no liabilities, I don't think they're going to develop a strong uh, measures for security. So, is there any? Are there? You mentioned on the on, on, on the sketch yeah. the the regulations. Do these regulations have any sanctions, <coughs> any <coughs> burden for the companies if if the money is stolen? Yes, they do. Uh, in Ghana, the the companies are regulated by the uh, National Communications Authority, the NCA, and in fact, what lessons learned from Kenya. Before its introduction in Ghana, the, the phone companies were made to team up with nine banks. The Bank of Ghana tried to intervene because Kenya's story started without the banks and later on with profit yeah. margins growing, the banks now started yeah. fighting to get in. Mm -hmm. So Ghana didn't want to get into that uh, deja vu of the game. So they, the Bank of Ghana tried to impose some regulations and some stipulations to ensure that uh, the compliance for the security agency. But are there specific sanctions on company? You mentioned that if somebody is blind, and if, if the agent yeah. takes somebody pin and steal the money, mm -hmm. yeah. is there any liability for the company? Yeah. Since yeah. the agent is representing the company. Yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the case of Kenya, what they have done is uh, since uh, m -Pesa just de developed, you know, uh, very fast. What they have done now, they have taken it upon themselves through CCK, Communication Commission of Kenya, to register all the SIM cards. So if if um, if if you have Safaricom, Lino, Airtel, or whatever line, it is registered with the with the with the company, and also most of your details now are because when you register, you have to give your ID and many other details. So if somebody steals uh, your money or takes your money, it's very easy now to follow that person. So uh, in fact, last month, they switched off all the lines that were not registered to avoid what you are saying, that kind of problem. They have switched off the line to make sure that the lines that are operational are the ones that are registered with CCK and with the mobile providers. Yeah. And if you don't use it, like I have a, a M Pesa phone, Kenya phone. When I come here, because I live in New York, they have to send me every three months. They have to either send me money in my phone to show that I'm using it, or it's it's, it's got to. 
Because if it's not active, they're going to sell the line to somebody else because it's, a, it's another security precaution. Mm -hmm. So when I went home, my line was gone. And I was telling them, no, but I need my line back because I need my money out of my phone. Mm -hmm. They says, no, you have to go register it mm -hmm. and get another one. And those are some of the regulatory type of things for security reasons. And I think there's a benefit, too, to recognize that if you have all this fraud issues, it's a PR issue, it's a public relations issue. So they're very cautious to make sure that if there's fraud or if there's you know insecurity, they deal with it because it's also a PR. People will go to another service if they don't. Hi, um, this kind of goes to the to the fraud issue as well. I'm wondering if you can talk about the need for a national ID and about would this work if you you know maybe if this wasn't the case among the groups that you guys worked with, but what happens if you're trying to translate it to groups that don't? you know, displaced people or people who just don't, kind of way off the grid, who don't have a, a national ID that, to show. How, do, how would it work or how could it work? Something like that. In Ghana, uh, there's been a drive for a national ID. And in fact, as of this year or last year, um, there's, there was a push to re-register all the same tax um, and to introduce people to mobile money at the same time. And uh, in a place where there is no national ID, I, frankly speaking, I don't know right off the top of my head what solution that would be. <laughs> I think that would be the headache of the phone companies. But uh, certainly, there should be a form of ID uh, individuals. Otherwise, you, you, in a place like Africa, it's going to be very difficult. A place where you can't easily trace a zip code to a person and so on and so forth. You don't even know streets. Street names, streets are not what we live on. So uh, you need a form of identification to, to because as I don't know how it started in Kenya, whether Kenya had a national ID before it started, so I would have to throw more light into what creative solutions that came together. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. And then your, your something. Yeah. Uh, I just had, um, I was thinking about the registering of cell phones, and I didn't realize it was going on in Kenya as well. So when I went back to Uganda this summer, I had to register my phone, mm -hmm. and I kind of delayed it as long as possible, and then I finally had to. <laughs> but I, um, was, I thought in Uganda it was partly because there's been a lot of protests mm -hmm. in the past mm -hmm. few years, mm -hmm. and I thought this was a way to, and this was brought up in the context of your panel yesterday about protests. I thought it was about that controlling that as a means to, you know, facilitate protest and things like that. But I didn't think about it in terms of this also, because this is another, you know, transfer of money and stuff is, is also on the rise right now. So do you think it's more about the political stuff or do you think it's about accountability for these money transfers that that's the reason things are being, the phones are being registered uh, in Kenya at least? Yeah. yeah, one, because of fraud and because of uh, money laundering. So no. you think it's more about accountability yeah. with, of this money thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And in Kenya now, if you want to withdraw money, you can't send money or withdraw money without showing your national ID. Uh, just the way you can't vote without your national ID. So the registration is paid on the national ID card. There are also other reasons why people are using the mobile phone. And I think that's an interesting study in itself, the fact that now, Healthcare systems are using mobile to communicate, you know, about medicines, about <coughs> health, about environment <coughs> and issues. So the registration, but it's sent messages. I mean, to send messages. Yeah, 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 so another, messages, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. other uses is something oh. that we should look at. So you register so that, that you can get this out to the to information. Exactly. Folks, yeah. yeah. So for example, a prenatal clinics. If a woman goes, she gets registered if she wants prenatal information and she registered her information and they know where to, you know, which phones to send these messages to on prenatal clinics. Right. So we're seeing more use of the mobile phone beyond mobile money sure, as well. Sure. So sure. registration yeah. uh, helps so it's and facilitates that. Sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Prof, um, two, two issues and um, I, I have a smartphone but I think my generation is very skeptical about the mobile phone companies, certainly in Ghana where I live. And um, you mentioned the regulator, but uh, before you can get the regulator to do anything, I have 
And we have several phones for different reasons. Sometimes the network isn't working, so we use the other network. So I have two numbers, and I use Airtel. And I have been asked about five or six different times to register when I have already registered. So that tells me, OK, so what's going on? And then they send you through a whole process. And then I'm sitting here wondering, why would I send money through this medium where they can't even tell whether I have registered <laughs> my number or not. So uh, my first question is, do you have a sense, uh, both for Ghana and Kenya, how much money gets missing through non-performance of the phone companies? Because sometimes you send a text message and the person is on the other side of the room and they, you know, it's telling me that the message can go or I call my husband and it says, his network is switched off and he says, of course my phone is on, or they get the message 24 hours later. So, you know, I, I, I think I have some healthy skepticism. So how much money is not going if you have a sense? And how many people are actually complaining or saying, oh, never mind Airtel, they will solve my problem anyway, so what the heck, okay, I lost 20 CDs. Mm -hmm. um, and my second question is, do you have a sense how much profit the telcos are making out of it? How much are they charging you per transaction that you send because if there's a beauty pageant and you're voting they charge you like maybe 20 pesos or 80 pesos or a CD whereas a regular SMS costs just 4 pesos. So I'd be interested to know if I'm transferring 20 CDs how much is the telco getting out of it and do we have a sense of their profit margin? Okay. Very good questions. Answer very simple. <laughs> to get that data you'd have to talk to the telcos. In Ghana data is not freely available as you would, you know, in the United States, there's a the, the portal, you could draw your data and make good comparisons. We went to the phone companies and when we did, we showed up at MTN, there are three main phone companies conducting mobile money. You have MTN, Tigo, and you have Airtel. When we go to MTN, although we introduce ourselves as individuals from the United States, have no affiliations with any, any other agency, but our schools doing research, they still felt we were working either for Tigo Cash or Airtel. <laughs> when we went to MTN, so to release that information, they didn't even give us that information. But how much will I pay as a, as a how, customer sending? Yeah, how comes to that one? Right? And now when we went to Tigo Cash, Tigo <coughs> also thought we were working on behalf of MTN. And in fact, that's been the <laughs> tango we're going through. We go to Airtel, they think we're working for the other person. So, are, it's very difficult getting them to give you their numbers. Okay. Added to that, they really don't have much to show for because the adoption rate in Ghana is so low, so low of the population. You talk to the average Ghanaian, and uh, it will be very difficult finding one person out of 10 telling you I've conducted this business before. So frankly speaking, at the moment, the amount of transactions are not huge for them to really block with their profit margins and so on and so forth, for you to really see the losses, gains, etc. As far as the, uh, the, the cost for transactions are concerned, yes, that I could give you some. For example, MTN, for example, if you transfer between one Ghana CDs to 50 Ghana CDs, um, you pay about 1.5 Ghana CDs. The registration is free. If you transfer above that, you pay about 50 Ghana CDs, you pay about 3% of that. So there is a fee for that. And probably <coughs> the people might think, and, and some, some did comment that. that if it's going to cost me to conduct mm -hmm. the transaction, mm -hmm. then I would, and I have to, to walk to the place. So shoe leather cost plus the <laughs> explicit cost I have to pay to do the transaction, because I'm going to add up in the future. So that's uh, the but in Uganda, it's cheaper to send it that way than through other places. In Uganda, it's cheaper. Because mm -hmm. I used it because I looked at the other options and that was the cheapest way to send it. Okay, the story is the same in Kenya. They wouldn't tell you, they wouldn't uh, really tell you about uh, those uh, statistics, about uh, how much they are making, how much money they are losing. But as far as uh, the charges are concerned, the cheapest one can pay in Kenya to send money, the minimum is around uh, 55 shillings. I don't know how much that is. About 70 parcels? 70 Yeah. 
Yeah, so that is the, that is the minimum uh, uh, safari form in charge. Now, when we were conducting the research, the people felt, uh, the interviewees felt that this was cheap in terms of the money, you know, compared to other uh, ways of sending money. Because like in Kenya, if uh, people were not having bank accounts, we can transfer the money and of course be charged more. Uh, the other unorthodox methods were maybe to go to the nearest country bus, give your money to somebody, a driver, who is driving towards your direction, and uh, tell them where to deliver the money. Other ways were them through the post office, which would take a lot of time. So uh, much as we don't have the statistics about how much money is getting lost, uh, most people have found it very convenient. Because uh, like in Nairobi, you know, if, if uh, you are staying in one part of Nairobi and you are sending money to somebody else who is within Nairobi, it's cheaper. Because when you, you have to send that money to pay the fare to go and the jam, you find it difficult. So there are many factors that have actually led to this mobile money transfer in Kenya for uh, so much. I'm not sure my question is fully articulated, but so far it's something like this. Do you think that there's a presumption given the differences in these two cases and um, the fact that, you know, technology, you know, globalizes fast and people feel like they have to jump on board. Is there a presumption among those of you who study mobile money, the funders of studies of mobile money, et cetera, that this is the way to go? Or is there a presumption that we need to step, I mean, and in part because you kind of have to get on the bandwagon because it's the future? Or is there a presumption that we can switch around this bandwagon if it's not working, or control the companies more, or step back and go to other forms of mobile, uh, of money transactions? I'm just kind of wondering about, it because you've been talking a lot the last couple of days about our assumptions about these things. So I don't know if that question makes sense. Yes, uh, it does. But amongst researchers, it's, we, we are not that set in stone to say that this is the only way to go. But certainly we are sure this is one of the sure ways to go to ensure financial inclusion of the poor. And uh, we feel that although countries are different in Africa, you know, uh, economically and also uh, culturally, there are still some semblance. And so what's happening in Kenya, or what has been successful in Kenya, could probably be important somewhat in some way. A certain way to, uh, to also be successful in a place like Ghana. So I guess it is still, for Ghana for example, it's still in the trial state, all right? And we all hoping that with time, uh, Ghanaians will buy into this product and then adopt, and probably we can reap the benefits that Kenyans have, have seen. But we are not saying this is the way to go. With its evolution, I believe that Technology only evolves if we use it, the first introduced. If the first computer that was introduced was never used or adapted, the next computer wouldn't come. Neither would we have the tablet at the end of the day. If Steve Jobs' idea was never bought, and at least tried it, would never have seen it. So I think that with the use of mobile money, as we try to explore the possible features in spite of the possible downsides, as we try to explore it, it will by itself, and with the ingenuity of, of, uh, of uh, people, we can transform it somehow to meet the needs. Again, we can never eliminate all the risks associated with use of this technology, but we can minimize it. We cannot say that mobile banking, which is pervasive in the United States, is fully secure. Can we ever say that? We can't say that, but with use, we can ensure some security features are in place to guarantee that transactions will be successfully conducted. And I think one of the richness of the IMTFI conference, the approach IMTFI has taken to facilitate this process of researchers, uh, researching mobile technology, is the fact that.
sitting in that conference for two days, I sat there, every presentation was like, my word, that's what they're doing in India? My word, that's what they're doing in Nepal? My word, Peru? You know, and you're sitting here and you realize it's about contextualization. It's gonna happen differently everywhere else. And how we contextualize in every situation to ensure that we consider the cultural, social, economic, all those religious, as we saw in many of the presentation, adaptation varying from a Muslim north to a Christian south in some of the countries. You know, we, we kept hearing these things, and these are all dynamics, I think, that raise the issue of how do we contextualize technology and make sure that we're not forcing it. It's not a top-down approach, but we actually allow all those factors to be considered through the adaption process. And I think that's the richness of IMTFI and what they do and their folks they do. I'm going to leave the last word for Jenny Fan, who also works for IM. I'm just going to make a very general comment, an institutional comment. With the inception of IMTFI in 2008, which came to the explosion of global money, this is the fourth year we're doing our conference, which we make bring all of our researchers in and pack them their projects. And this is the first year when we organize the panels, this is the first year that we had a panel on resistance and barriers to local money uptake. I mean, so that's what we're, I mean, we just basically see it's on the ground. I mean, you know, we don't come into computers, we just see it there. And this would be the first year we have projects where we're, you know, looking at, you know, why is it working money everywhere? Is that, I mean, will it go? I mean, this is, I mean, everybody in this space is looking for it. The magic point. I mean, it's not just researchers, but like telescopes and physicists and stakeholders, and they're still turning over the blocks, you know. So it's, it's a very, very interesting thing to be in there. And then I'll <coughs> If I may just add, feeding of the last uh, uh, panel, people adopt adoption is like a dance. You learn it as you go, and you improve it as you yeah. go. So I believe that at the end of the day, it's going to get better. It might not be called mobile money, mm -hmm. but something, and probably it might feed off this concept and become something greater. That's why we are excited about it. I believe that's why UCI funds, you know, supports uh, IMTFI to help researchers to come up with these ingenious ideas and uh, pursue uh, this research. So we appreciate the support you UCI gives us and uh, IMTFI uh, gives us to conduct this research. Uh, just to check in one more thing, like my colleague said, in March 2013, March the 12th to the 13th, we're having a conference on mobile money and then delving to talk about the barriers to the uptake of mobile money. We bring in a diverse group of people. It will not be straight academicians who will have, like you rightly said, consumers, retailers, mobile money operators, regulators, etc., uh, at the table to discuss all this issue. Probably a queen mother might be there. <laughs> a community leader yeah. may be there. And don't, sure. don't exactly. make sure you can get your money when you get the dollar. Exactly. <laughs> so I want to thank all of you for such a fabulous discussion. Thank you all for speaking.